And finally, I did transition pictures for astrophysicist Carl Sagan, who died in 1996 at the age of 62 of pneumonia, although he had a bout with cancer leading up to that. This guy had an intellect the size of Venus. He wrote hundreds of scientific papers. He wrote books. He wrote uh, the movie Contact, I think, the one with Jodie Foster, because he believed in extraterrestrial life. He didn't think, actually, that extraterrestrials were coming here as often as people believed they were, because if there were that many planets in the galaxy and the universe, why would they keep picking on us, really? But he was very open-minded in that way. And also, interestingly, from our point of view, he was agnostic. He didn't wholeheartedly deny the existence of God. In fact, he wrote, some people think God is an outsized, light-skinned male with a long white beard sitting on a throne somewhere up there in the sky, busily tallying the fall of every sparrow. Others consider God to be essentially the sum total of the physical laws which describe the universe. I do not know of any compelling evidence for anthropomorphic patriarchs controlling human destiny from some hidden celestial vantage point. But it would be madness to deny the existence of physical laws. So he was open. He was a man of wonder. He looked at the universe like a child looks at it, wanting to learn and know more and find out how things work and why they're there and so on, which made him a fascinating subject for the transition pictures. When I went into the energy, there was this cave thing I always see. Metaphorical cave, it doesn't really exist, but it's a setting for what the person is about to experience. When I went in, there was a frame, a four poster frame made of aluminium, aluminum as Americans call it. And he was inside the four legs of this frame, which is really interesting because it suggested that that was the limit of his knowledge and of his expectation of learning. Facts, science, something rigid that you could depend on. Nothing bigger than that. Even though he could see there was something bigger out beyond the frame, it had to be fitted into the framework that he already believed in. But he can't just stay there, because the current that's involved in these processes is constantly pulling the soul, the consciousness forward. And he stepped out of the frame and started walking down towards the tunnel. But he didn't seem involved in what was going on. Which, for a man like him, I thought was odd. Why would he not be interested in this amazing experience that he was going through? That his consciousness was going through? And you know what I thought? I thought, what if, instead of following him through the tunnel like I normally do, I tried to see the entire process through his eyes? Maybe that's why he's not interested, because something else is going on that he can see and I can't. Right? So I went in, and the cave was not there in his consciousness. He was standing against a brick wall. Plain. Boring. So he started walking. And as he went, he entered a series of brick-walled passageways. There was no magic to it. He wasn't looking around going, ooh, this is amazing, because there was nothing to be amazed by. He just carried on walking around and around, following his nose, bricks on either side, very, very pragmatic, moving forward, nothing to see here. But he went on for a very long time. It was wearing him down. It's like, just keep him going. Eventually, he'll mellow. He'll see that there's more to this process than uh, he's been expecting. Now, I came out of him, out of his eyes, and I looked where he was. And he was at the dome. He was actually the normal thing I see, that um, dome of light that always seems to be there at the end of this tunnel. 
Only when I went back in again, he wasn't seeing the dome. He was seeing, hmm, he was seeing, it's hard to describe, it was like a wall of a jelly-like substance. Now, he was fascinated by this. There was a sort of luminescence to it. There were lights behind it. Ah, now what's this? This, I really am curious about. And he went over and he pushed his hand into the jelly, or the jelloid substance. And it sank in and it was warm. It was like sticking your hand in custard or something. And skin tight. It just hugged his arm. And it continued accepting him. It was very welcoming, very inviting, tantalizing almost. Like, what is this feeling? Where does it lead? What's going on behind this jelloid wall? And it slowly absorbed him. And you would think, well, I won't go too far because I won't be able to breathe. But there's no air to breathe. You don't breathe here. He just went into it face first. I was like, whoa, wow. And it absorbed him and it closed around him and he vanished into it. Having finished that, I went back to the original pictures, the ones that I would see doing what I do. And he was walking up the tunnel in the normal way. He comes to the dome. He reaches into it in the same way that he did with the jelloid wall. Goes further, goes further. He's quite intrigued by it all. And then just walks into it and vanishes. So it's the same end, just with a different experience depending on the person you are and what your subjective reality is. And it made me think that we don't choose what happens to us after we die. Maybe we choose it before we die. We earn it. We get given the end that we have trained ourselves to accept. Maybe that's it. Carl Sagan, as brilliant and accomplished a man as he was on the mortal side, had basically trained himself to be so analytical and scientific and pragmatic that he got that kind of transition. Whereas somebody else who was invested in the spiritual side in a big way would get something else, something more fitting to what they had earned in their lifetime. But in the end, according to this, the welcome we receive is the same for everybody. No matter what we believe, no matter what our expectations are, no matter what our subjective perception of reality is, we all end up in the same place. And how fast we get there and in what state depends on how much restriction we place on ourselves in life. It can be easy. It can be hard and long-winded. It seems to be a choice. A choice that we can take responsibility for and enjoy or suffer, I suppose, the results later. It's all down to us in the end. The more we connect with the divine splinter inside of us to our understanding of God, of infinite intelligence, the easier our passage from form to formless is likely to be. I'm 
that's what I learned from Carl Sagan. Thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. Subscribe, like, share. I always say that, but if you would, that'd be great. Follow me on Twitter if you want to, at Cash Peters, that'd be good too. Otherwise, I'll see you next time, guys. Bye-bye.